scripture today comes from Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of age. I was a nervous little eight-year-old whenever I waded into the waters of baptism at my home church when I was growing up, and honestly, I had no clue what I was getting myself into. Sure, I had heard God call, and I had listened, and I knew that I needed to respond. Baptism. It is just water, right? Baptism. It is just water, right? I think there's a little more going on than just water. And I've heard some liken baptism to a wedding. But even then, some people say that weddings are just a piece of paper, right? But for those of you who have given marriage a chance, you would attest that marriage is way more than just a piece of paper. Weddings and baptisms are a lot more alike than you might think. They both start out with folks kind of testing the waters a little bit. Before a wedding is even mentioned, you'll probably hear I really enjoy being around this person. And before baptism, you might hear, I think I hear God speaking into my life. Before long, you've got a date picked out and a place picked out, and you say, I want to make a public commitment to this person. And with baptism, you're making a public commitment to Christ. This isn't just a piece of paper. A piece of paper is a contract. Marriage is a covenant. Baptism and discipleship is a covenant. Both change us. Both set us out on a, on a different path. Both are looked at as a journey. Not just a one-time, set it and forget it kind of thing. No, we're in this for the long haul. Stanley Harawas says about weddings that we have the community around us to witness, to hold us to the promises we make when we don't realize what we're doing. The community is there to remind you of the promises that you make. And we could say something similar about baptism. The church gathers around baptism to show their support, to show their, their commitment to you and, and the, the commitment you're making to Christ. We're there to witness and support you in this new transition you're making in life. Our church celebrates beach baptism in a setting very much like this, out in the water. And we witness the commitments that people are making to follow Christ. We're there to come alongside them in their new commitments, and we mark that change with water. Showing how you're participating in the resurrection and how you're making that a part of your own life. Dying to one's old self and being raised to new life out of the water baptism. To give you context for our passage today, Jesus has walked with his disciples. He has taught them. They have lived together. They have watched him walk the road to the cross. Jesus has died. Jesus has risen. And now he's addressing them right before he ascends. Talking about a big transition, their leader is about to leave them. And you could hear them saying, what do we do now, Jesus? Jesus says, you've got to get to work. Just because we're not going to be together every day like we have been does not mean that your work here is finished. Jesus says in John's account that the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater works than these. Jesus is saying that just because I'm leaving does not mean that your work here is finished. Y'all, we are just getting started. Last week, we began a discipleship series called Follow Me. And it's two really simple words. It's the call we all have on all of our lives, the call to follow Jesus in discipleship. And it's a journey. And Diedrich Bonhoeffer says that discipleship and grace is costly. Such a grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus. It is costly because it calls us to follow and it is grace because of who we follow, Jesus Christ. 
Following is a big commitment, but y'all, it's Jesus we're following. He's going to give us the grace to make it through. The text for today says that some of the disciples doubted. Now, when I hear that, it doesn't shock me to hear that they doubted. I mean, we all have a hard enough time wrapping our minds around this resurrection stuff, and it's been 2,000 years for us. To be the community witnessing the resurrection for the first time would probably raise some pretty big questions. I feel their doubting and their questioning might have sounded like, I don't believe it, y'all. Or even, you've got to be kidding, right? The scripture just says, some doubted. But I honestly believe that there would be a genuine feeling of helplessness. What are we going to do now? It says they worshipped, but yet some doubted. What are we supposed to do? I think we all, just like the disciples in verse 17, go from worship to doubting in the same sentence, and we struggle. What do we do now, Jesus? So he responds with a great commission. If you've hung around me much at all, you've probably heard me talk about calling. I think it's a huge part of the life of discipleship, both the call to discipleship, the beginning of the Christian journey, and also the call to the work as a disciple. God calls out to us to follow him as his disciples, to begin the journey of the Christian life, and that's part one. Part two is the calling I believe very strongly about, which is called vocation, the call to work. This call to work does not necessarily mean a job that you get paid to do. No, although sometimes it is, I often feel that it can be something you do out of passion for free. Retirees still have a call to work. Stay-at-home parents still have a call to work. Engineers and business executives have a call to work. Doctors and insurance salesmen have a call to work call to work for the kingdom. What do we do now? The call to work is not just for those who work for churches or who are ministers or chaplains or some other kind of role like that. No, the call to work is on all of our lives. We are all called to do something. Many think their call to discipleship is separate from their vocation, their, their job. No, I think your call is your mission field. I believe that we have many callings in life, and I believe that God calls us to do all sorts of things throughout our journey as disciples. But I believe that these two, the call to become a disciple and the call to live out the work of the disciple, are intertwined. These two are very much connected. You just have to figure out what your calling is. Let me explain. We need doctors who live out their faith in their calling of compassion for humanity. We need engineers who, when building a bridge, are called to the justice, into consideration, into the way they connect people in these communities. We need ethical teachers, ethical salesmen. We need eth ethical executives and doctors and lawyers and so forth and so on. Professionals who live out the call of Christ and their vocational call. They're bringing the kingdom down to earth. What do we do now? There's a call to work today in our current situation in America. We stand heartbroken for the family of George Floyd. We also stand heartbroken for our law enforcement for this community and in our country. We can join together to work on the same team and help be the bridge and work to stop racial injustice in our country. We must respond with empathy we Christians must do our part to listen first to the voice that is crying out in the wilderness, to those who feel like the weight of the system is against them. Then we should ask, what can I do to help? What can we do to help? We must put Micah 6, 8 to work, which says, when inquiring to God about what he wants from his people, does he want burnt offerings or sacrifices or endless rivers of oil? We get the response, no. God doesn't want that stuff. God wants you to do something. God wants our call to work. And he says in that scripture, 
He has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This is our call to work too. So to our graduates, you're now in this big transition in your life and you like the disciples and many of us today are asking, what do we do now, Jesus? I look to these waters. Baptism is such a vital part of our life and our journey as disciples. But it's not just about your baptism. It's not just about how you were baptized and raised to new life. It's also the work to which you are called. In the midst of the doubts and the questions of the disciples, Jesus assures them that this is the work that they too are called to do, to go and to baptize, to go to teach the world the ways of the kingdom and to guide them to these waters. And these waters are the beginning of their journey of discipleship as well. And he assures them they are never alone in this work that they are doing, that he will be with them always, even until the end of the age. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for your promise to be with us always. Lead us in our call to make disciples and the call to work in bringing your kingdom down to earth. Open our eyes to whatever it is that you have called each one of us to do. Help us to be just peacemakers in this world that we live in and live out the example of Christ in our work. And to our graduates about to embark on this next chapter, grant them the wisdom to discern your call for their lives and to live out that call as they go and make disciples of all nations. Amen. We are so excited about our graduates. and We're so proud of all that they have accomplished. And at this point in our worship, we would like to stop and let them tell you a little bit about themselves and let you hear about their stories. I'm Smith Anderson and I'm graduating from New Hanover High School. Next year I will be attending the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Go Heels! Hi, my name is Tata Blue. I'm graduating from Hoggard High School and then going to Cape Fear for two years and then transferring to NC State. My name is Moon Creek and I'm graduating from Korea Readiness Academy at Mosley and I'm joining U.S. Marine Corps. Hello, my name is Jimmy Glendening, currently graduating from Hoggard High School. In the fall, I'll be enrolling at Brandeis University to play soccer up in Boston, Massachusetts. Roll dice. I'm Jackson Hicks. I'm graduating from New Hanover in the class of 2020, and I plan on going to Hampton Sydney College to study biology and business economics. My name is Davis Hunt. I'm graduating from New Hanover High School and my plans after that is uh, App State in the fall. I'm Jacqueline Jordan, graduating from Hoggard High School. I will be attending William Peace University. My name is Bradley Meadows. I'm graduating from New Hanover High School and I plan to study zoology at NC State. I'm Alexis Mearns and I'm graduating from Cape Fear Academy and attending North Carolina State University in the fall. Go Pack! I'm Macon Sumner, graduating from Hoggard. I will be attending Lenore Ryan to further my academic and athletic career to play lacrosse, go Bears and go Vikes. Hi, I'm Briar Taylor. I'm graduating from Howard High School and I'm planning to major in biology at Appalachian State University. Roll Nears. Hi, I'm Anna Turlington. I plan on graduating from Coastal Christian High School and I plan on attending uh, Appalachian State University studying apparel design and merchandising. Hi, my name is Caitlin Tuttle. I am graduating from New Hanover High School and I will be attending Appalachian State University in the fall. Go Nears! I'm Lily Womble and I'm going to East Carolina University to either major in Biomedical Sciences 
or to pursue a career in veterinary science. Because it is our custom to receive communion on the first Sunday of every month as members of First Baptist Church, then today we celebrate Holy Communion. At this time, you may want to prepare for that by receiving some, by getting some type of a wafer, a piece of bread, and something that would be a casual drink that you typically have when you have a meal. For that's what Jesus used on the night that he had a meal with his disciples in the upper room. Scripture tells us that at the conclusion of the meal, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. Blessed art thou, O God, that sends forth food from the earth. And he broke it. He passed it among his disciples. And he said, this is my body that's given for you. As you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. And in a like manner, he took the cup and he blessed it. Blessed art thou, O God, that sends forth fruit from the vine. He passed it among the disciples. And he said to them, this is the blood of the new covenant that I make with you as a symbol of my forgiveness. I offer it to you as my own life's blood. As you eat this bread and as you drink from the cup, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Congratulations to each of our graduates and to their families. We are so proud of you. You know, normally in our service at this time, we would invite the graduates to come up and you have the opportunity to come by and say congratulations personally. But obviously we can't do that this morning. But I do wanna invite you this afternoon to the Activity Center at 4.30. We will have a drive-through graduation celebration. The graduates and their families will be spaced out in the parking lot and you can come by and honk your horn, roll down your windows and say congratulations to each of them on their accomplishments. Church family, we really hope you will come. We cannot wait to see you. The graduates and their families are so excited about today. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I hope to see you this afternoon and if not, we'll see you next week.